I'm a small town kid born with a big city spirit. I choose to play a lot of awesome roles in life. Mom, wife, entrepreneur, CEO, board member, investor, and mentor. 17 years ago, I founded a marketing consultancy, and ever since, my husband JR and I have been building our careers and our family on the exact same timeline. Yep, that means four kids, three businesses, two careers, all building towards one life we love. When I discovered that I could purposefully embrace all of these ands in my life, it unlocked my world, and I want that for you too. I'm Tiffany Souter, and this is Scared Confident. Nick Smirelli is in a place in his professional journey where I would say he's like in the gap. He had this really intentional corporate career and then had a gut feeling that he needed to go pursue entrepreneurship and has spent the last 10 plus years leading a company that his name has really become synonymous with. And in the last 18 months, came to the realization that that's not his path forward. And so I asked him to come on. Nick and his wife, Caitlin, are good friends of my husband and I's. And I knew he was in the messy gap of not knowing where he's going yet, but knowing for sure that he needed to leave where he was. And I asked him if he would share where he's at right now with my audience, because I think it's so easy to make sense of our lives and our journeys when it's in the rearview mirror. It's like, oh, yeah, I did this and then I did this and I did this. And we talk about it in a way that's really neat and tidy. And so this is Nick's middle. This is Nick's gap. This is Nick's pause. And I hope you hear, as I did in this conversation, just the courage to stay present when you're in a place like this and to know that no matter where you're at in your life or how successful it seems that you've been, that sometimes there's a darkness as you're heading towards the next thing. So catch people up on what's going on and then we'll dig in from there. Yeah. So I look at my first 20 years, uh, I've, I've worked for two organizations. So I worked for a big organization called Ingersoll Rand. Uh, in that job, I went from St. Louis to New York City to China to Charlotte to Atlanta. Um, I said yes to everything. Uh, that was a big part of, of that career. At the tail end of that one, realized I had this opportunity and this just interest in entrepreneurship. So from there in 2010, moved to be employee number four at an organization called Cadellnet. Joined two friends of mine from college. Uh, I sent them an email out of haste. Just another day, I was on the road, got stuck. I can't remember where I even got stuck on an airplane and said, I need to make a life transition. And so I sent them a note and I said, I don't care what it takes. I would like to buy in from an equity perspective. I would like to invest in your organization. I know nothing about technology, and this is a technology startup at the time, but I do have experience in operations, sales, and marketing. So I knew I could contribute. Uh, they had had the That was your first email? That was literally what my email. What a grenade. Oh, it really is. It was huge. <laughs> Think of, especially 12 years later, of just how significant a yes. off-the-cuff emotional email changed fundamentally, I would, I mean, arguably every part of my life. That my wife has- Again, we look at my marriage. I've been married for 12 years. And of those 12 years, 11 and a half has been me as a senior leader at Cadellnet. Yes. Like I, my marital identity, my family identity, my kids have never known me as, as anything else but the guy that was in charge of you know, serving the company mm -hmm. uh, in some capacity. So yeah, you, you look at like seemingly simple, very off the cuff yeah. things and just how big that was. And how their response that day changed. Yeah. You know, for them, they replied and said, absolutely, yes. But I mean, Nobody that could have, knows. Yeah. yeah, that could have been a ha ha, uh, you enjoy the day and move on. Uh -huh. And we would have never have had what we, we created for the last 12 years. Like it's, it's, what were you shocking. looking back? What were you running towards? What do you think was attractive to you about this chaotic, small, <laughs> unformed thing, which yeah. is really the antithesis of the environment you were in. Correct. In Rant. I mean, they're massive global company. Yeah. And, and that was the most fascinating thing. And I think there was this linearity about working in, an, in a corporate environment. I you know, started off as a marketing specialist, moved to a marketing manager, then I moved to a sales director. I was lucky. I was actually the youngest. My like claim to fame at Ingersoll Rand, I was the youngest director 
in the company history, which I was really proud of. So I was 26. Wow. Um, I ran a national team of sales individuals, which allowed me to have to move so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was that linearity and that lack of, I don't know. I think I think I wanted the chaos. I was excited mm-hmm. for that. And I was also excited to to test the waters. I would say like I look at the first 20 years of my career as marked by like intensity. Like that was where I was at. And I couldn't see this, you know, one to one of how hard I worked at Ingersoll Rand and producing a huge output. Mm-hmm. And I knew in a small business environment the level of effort that I could put in and the output that I could create is so as was exponentially higher. And I saw that as a chance to do that. And it didn't make any sense. The business was based in St. Louis. I was living in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. I had a company car, a great six-figure income. Um, I think I made $12,000 the first year at Goodellnet. I uh, had to sell my car, and I was there 48 of the 52 weeks of the year. So fundamentally very different mm-hmm. from staying at the Marriott where I was you know, a diamond partner <laughs> yeah, at Delta. Right. Like, exactly. They were like, hello, oh, Mr. Smirelli. Yes, yeah. right? And, um, and it was actually the moment that really set me off on that day in the airplane was there was a bunch of us sitting in first class because I just traveled all the time, so mm-hmm. I had all the status. And there were a bunch of just, I don't know, 55, six-year-old individuals that were rolling. At the time, they had those like large roller bags that you could kind of put two or three days' worth of clothes and your mm-hmm. and your, all your files um, because it was 2010 at the time. You had files mm-hmm. that you had to carry around with you. And I just saw like sadness. Uh, and I was like, this is the trajectory that I'm on. I mean, I'm going to be permanently on a plane. I just got married. And I'm like, this is not the life that I want. So it was my chance to truly say, how do I create what I need? And entrepreneurship, I think, more than anything else, gives you the opportunity to say, like, for better or for worse, uh, to create your fate. And Was you- there somewhere or somebody in your past that you had seen a window into small business? Because your dad or your family's not entrepreneurs, no. right? So how did you even know that? I mean, there's a lot of people at 30-ish that don't actually have the intuition to know that all the things all the attributes you just described about small business scrappy startup work hard yeah you know disproportionate returns if you kind of (laughs) hit yep um but like really tough starting point did you just know it yeah i don't know really see it right yeah i didn't and then i've never grew up in it i i I don't my my father he was a professor and he worked his way up to president of a university Uh at the tail end of his career but everything was linear. Yeah. My parents are very so linear people. I, d- I don't know where it comes uh-huh. from. It's but just an par- interesting observation. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, and I wish, I wish I could put myself, you know, 12 years ago and think like, what am I modeling after? And I don't know if I was modeling after anything. I just knew what I was doing wasn't mm-hmm. what I needed at the time. Um, and I knew I had more energy to give. Energy has always been my thing. If you, again, anybody who spent more than three and a half minutes with me, like nose energy is the adjective you probably used to describe Mm -hmm. me. So I had this just, you know, potential energy to do something. And it just seemed like the coolest place to put it. Okay. So let's fast forward 12 years, which is like a couple, you know, a couple months ago, but the same intuition sort of starts screaming at you. Correct. Uh, You said, I need to make a life change was what you said to yourself in so many words the first time. And I think this phrase came back to the foreground for you, like frontal lobe, this is happening. No question. So take us to there because yeah. that's not as long ago. No, it isn't as long ago. It's a lot more real. So uh, the, I think I've known for a year or two that, that I was ready to make a change. And I think my body was whispering it. I was like, going to say, energy, you were tired. I was tired. In a way um, that Nick Smirelli is not tired. And Yeah. And, and I think that was telling. Being Nick Smirelli means that you power through things. Um, and I think my body was just whispering like this isn't right. And at the time, we were dead set in COVID. Um, I had made some big promises to the organization about job security and what we were going to do. And the world is in chaos. And my job as a leader at the time was to provide stability and consistency. Um, so I wasn't allowed to have thoughts and feelings at the time. I was on stage being the rock that my team needed be, me to be. And the reality was, in the background, my brain was like, you need a break. <laughs> You cannot operate at this level for 12 straight years um, and then throw in pandemic economic crisis. And I ignored those probably for too long. Um, And it really came to a head probably the latter part of last year where I knew versus kind of vaguely understood where I knew something had to change. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about that is I'm a big, big fan of chess. Like my son and I play chess. Um, 
everything I do as a leader, I'm always trying to predict and to give myself options. Do I have an off-ramp in some capacity? So I'd already started to get my master's two years before because I knew at some point I wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. So I wanted that chess piece to, to be going on. Um, we'd already started the process of, of building up an executive team to move somebody to a president role. Mm -hmm. So we'd already started these things. I'd already figured out, okay, if, if there was an economic downturn, what would we do as an organization? And would we have to look at investors outside to, to provide stability and knowledge and maturity to the organization? So we'd already had those conversations. So all of a sudden, there was this confluence of my brain knowing I needed to make a shift, that the intensity that I chose through my career needed to shift. This, I'll call it perfect, but it really wasn't, confluence of things that allowed us as an organization and me personally to make a change that felt arguably the most selfish and scary thing that I've had to do as a leader. Because at the end of the day, you, know, you log on to LinkedIn, log on to everything else. It's serving others, it's taking care of others. Mm -hmm. And yes, don't get me wrong, winning accolades, you know, growing an organization for the last few years, you know, in some capacity, making decent money. Um, well, you guys were like, I mean, I think this is, you were Inc. 5,000 nine times. Correct. Of 12. Yes. I mean, just to like give a quantitative <laughs> measure of speed. Like that's, yes. that's, we were five or six years and I broke at that. Yeah. Like that's, that's 50% more. Like it's real. It's, it's just so much. It's, it's real. Um, and that, that level of consistency. And then also trying to do that, we try to be best places to work. We wanted to also do this. Like we had to be a B Corp because we wanted to make sure we we're always giving back. Doing things without intensity is not my thing. Like it's, if we're going to go, we're going to do it all the best. If I'm going to join an organization, I'm going to be part of the board. If I'm going to, if I'm going to say I'm going to travel, I'm going to go to a thousand different countries. Mm -hmm. Like that is what I'm going to do. If we're going to grow, we're going to grow the fastest of everybody in the city. Who said it first? I was like, who and to whom maybe? This like realization where your body's kind of whispering to you. At some point, the words had to come out of somebody's mouth. Did yep. Caitlin say to you, Caitlin's his wife, for those of you who don't know them, um, did you say it to you? Did you say it to her? Did you say it to the mirror? Did you say, you know what I mean? Like, how did it come out first? Do you remember? Gosh, you know what? It's it's so weird. So um, I wrote it at one point mm. and I wrote it a year before. So I have always tried to be the guy that journals. I think I have 13, maybe 14 journals with like nine pages filled up and then I quit. Uh <laughs> So I remember last year being like, okay, this is hard. So I'm going to start journaling again. So like I opened up my old journals and I found like comments. And like, if we were watching a movie, you'd read these journal entries and be like, oh man, he's either going to go nuts soon or he's going to have to make a significant change. I didn't read it that way until that day. And I'm like, oh man, I've been, I've been trying to tell myself this for a little while. So I think I wrote it out first. And then I mentioned to Caitlin and talked through what that meant. She never said it to me. I think she wanted me to figure it out on my own. Um, and then I shared it with my partners and said, hey, this is kind of where I'm at. How far off am I? And what does this mean? Mm -hmm. um, again, part of my job has always been, how is this going to be perceived by others? And then the other thing is, how is this going to affect the thing that I have invested so much into? So getting their take on the whole thing and really saying it out loud is, this is real. Um, but it never got easier. It never got easier to tell each part of my executive team, I mean, Obviously, they had to go through stages of grief of, of processing that, telling the organization, man, I, I, I had written out that thing a thousand times. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you read the words, you think the words have like dulled in some capacity because you've looked at it so many times and then you say it out loud and man, I was a mess. <laughs> did you cry? I did. Yeah. I did. And I didn't think I was going to. I thought like I had spent so much time on making sure I understood it, what it was and I use so much of my rational brain of like all the things that had to happen to make sure that I truly believed what I was saying, which is the organization is going to be better off. You are in a better place because of this transition. And I believe that. I still do. Mm -hmm. um, but man, you say the words in front of the people and you see the faces of people that, you know, you said come alongside me for so long. And then you're saying, hey, I'm going to be making a shift, but I promise it's going to get better. Like that's hard. The truth is, as leaders, when we say that, we don't know for sure. We are doing everything that we know about mm -hmm. to make the outcome be what it needs to be. But the truth that we know yes. is that we don't know for sure. And that is like, uh, it's like, I think sometimes it's just Scary. that tightrope. Yeah, where like your emotion is like, I want to promise you. Yes. I can't promise you. 
but I'm doing everything I know to do. And, and we talked a lot about that in in the, the thing of saying, hey, we've we made these decisions on behalf of this. These are our contingencies on behalf of that. And then the fear of just how are people going to react? And at the time, I decided there was only two possible options. One, uh, kind of yawning and boredom. <laughs> See ya. You know, we, yeah. we didn't like you anyway. Uh-huh. Um, and then the other option was sheer chaos of like, you are the company. We cannot live without you. None of those things happened. Sure, there's some people that probably went each direction. But at the end of the day, it, it was perfectly in the middle. But man, that fear of like, what's going to happen next? How are people going to take it? Like, you just mm-hmm. you can't predict that either. Mm-hmm. Um, because it is so real and emotional. And we made it real and emotional on purpose within the organization. We made it about people. And so having the person at the top of the organization say, hey, believe in me and that this is a good thing. It's hyper-personal at that time, especially when he's crying in front of the, <laughs> the well, company Well, I think as it well. makes you human. I mean, I think that makes what makes you lovable as a leader and real to be followed and all those kinds of things. I mean, it's part of it. Yeah. What, what do you hope your legacy is at Goodell Nut? I think about it this way. If you're walking through a restaurant and there's a group of people that have worked for you for a long time that don't yeah. know you're walking by and yeah. you overhear them talking about like Nick's legacy. Oh geez. What do you hope they're talking about? Oh man. So I'm going to kind of answer the question just with a, like a quick story about something that I just overheard people doing and it didn't necessarily involve Nick Smirley, but I, with any luck, I, I feel like I created the foundation of that. Our, we have individuals in the organization that do kind of call coordination. So you call in and kind of make sure you get to the right person during the Thanksgiving holidays. Most people are off. So those individuals are working. They still need to be there because, unfortunately, we're the lowest common denominator. If, if any clients are working on any day, we've got to be around. And they're like, we're not going to be busy. What can we do? And they started making phone calls to both individuals within Goodell and outside the organization just to check in them on Thanksgiving. And they found a list and they called people. And I'm like, that is my legacy. It's like that behavior is there because, in theory, all those individuals are hired during my tenure. We built a culture of people and taking care of each other and being thoughtful about the whole person versus just what does this mean as, as a worker or what does this mean as a client that's calling in? And so I would say that would be the biggest thing is this like idea of, of seeing the humanity in others and having people like just do these things organically. And I would say the second thing is just this culture of learning and a growth mindset. A personal value of mine is this idea of like curiosity. It's like, I just think everything is interesting. I try to mimic my children who like, especially our youngest right now, who just, he, she's three, like, the world is the greatest place in the world. Every ramp to it, like mm-hmm. an airplane is a ramp to sprint down and scream we. You know, like mm-hmm. that's the attitude I want to have about life. And I hope that the company is still like that, that we're investing in training and having kind of the boring stuff. But like there's a genuine curiosity about each other and knowledge and seeing growth, even, I mean, growth of the organization, sure, but growth of each other. Uh, I hope people are talking about like, I learned a lot. Um I can't, I know we're never going to be the place that says like, that was the best place I've ever worked for every single person. So I know that that can't be the perfect legacy, but I would say if you do not come out of the organization and say like, I've learned a lot, then I failed. And that's a, that's a miss on my, my legacy. Awesome. So we're at a place where the thing that you've spent the most percentage of your waking hours (laughs) on is really in a day. Like there is a ramp, but in a day for the purposes of my dramatic story <laughs> and <laughs> your dramatic that, yeah. life. <laughs> yep, of course. It's gone. Yeah. And you have to replace it with something. Yeah. Like, where are you at in the process? Or like, where? when was the last day and where are yeah. we Yeah, so so I, I made the announcement in July. Uh, we had to backfill a few other roles to make my transition happen. But my, I would say, last, like, truly working day was about three weeks ago. We had a okay, holiday party. Okay, so 21 days. Yeah, we are like, not, yeah. yeah, we're not too far off of it, yeah. So we've taken this thing off of your plate and now you're being asked to rebuild your time and yes. rebuild this version of Nick Smirelli. So yeah. what's the process been like and what's fear saying to you also in this kind of stage? Oh, yeah. It, it's it's so interesting. I, I feel like, and I'm glad we're meeting today because the last few days have actually had, I would say, a bit more of that, whoa, what did I do? Um, so I'm a professor at Butler and I have kind of a light teaching opportunity there and I'll continue to do that. I've been offered roles to run companies, which is exciting and equal parts flattering, but not the right step for me. To me, as I look at, I'm going to say the next 20 years, but it may not be as long as that, is this idea of investing in others, just allowing myself to say, I've gained 20 years of wisdom, made 20 years of mistakes, uh, 
and to, in some capacity, give that back to others. So looking at startups, looking at other organizations and trying to say, how do I thoughtfully add to my life more opportunities to give back? And the weird thing about that, I talked about that linearity. Even within Gadelnet, there was a linearity. There was, you add new clients, you add new staff, you add new clients, you add new staff. You come to a pandemic, then you you pivot a tiny bit, but you're still kind of in this like march. Now I have, let's say, 40 hours a week to fill and I've got a few hours teaching and I've got a few hours doing these other things. But every week now I have to fill up my day and like curate experiences for myself that hopefully are value aligned. But I don't know what that looks like anymore. And it's weirdly exhausting for the last few days as I kind of look ahead. And I'm like, man, is this really what I signed up for is, you know, chasing new opportunities. And I'm doing the coolest things. Like I'm really working with some really cool companies and people doing fun things. But I've got to chase those down in a way that I sort of miss somewhat the predictability of, mm-hmm. even of the chaos, but the predictability of Monday morning, I kind of know what I'm getting myself into. I was afraid that by not being a leader, um, I would lose that identity part of me, that I am a CEO or that being a huge part. And it really, that has not been an issue. Um, I think for me, it's, I fear irrelevance and I fear not having experiences that challenge me. And so making sure that I'm picking those opportunities well has been an important part of my journey. But I don't know, finding ways to to fill my day and being responsible for that, it's probably been busier than I've ever had. Like I, my friends joke that I have like seven jobs now instead of one. So um, being busy has never been the issue. But am I being busy with the right things? Mm-hmm. It's just reshuffling everything. Like I figured out how to be a CEO-ish and I don't know how to do this well. And that for me is intimidating, mm-hmm. especially coming on December because you get now you get this like reset of the year. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I can deal with a little bit of chaos until the end of the year. But then, oh, man, I've got a whole year to fill next year. How do I do that well? And am I picking the right things? And I don't know the answer to that right now. And I feel like I'm in this like just weird, nebulous, floaty zone of just grasping onto things and seeing how they turn out, which is equal parts fun and exhausting because I don't know, does this make the most sense? And, and what am I committing to? Uh, so still learning that part. I know I have kind of a core like thesis which is, again, this idea of investing in others, this idea of seeing myself as bigger than just work and a little bit of family, this like renewed focus now on just learning and knowledge and how am I spending my time doing more around learning. I've kind of rekindled this focus around faith and reading and sharing stories with people and going out to lunch with people in a way that I've never had even the brain capacity to do. I'm serving on two additional boards in the community. So like, I, I have a thesis for how this is going to work. Mm-hmm. Some days when I go for a long run, there is a beautiful simplicity to hopping on the Monon and running straight. Mm-hmm. I just, I can put a music on, I can put a podcast on and I don't have to think. I'm still doing the work, but I don't have to think. Sometimes you go on a trail and you do a mile trail here and then you decide if you go left or right. And then I do a mile here and I have to decide if I go left or right. And then I just, do I backtrack? Do I do this trail? Do I do all this other trail? And there's an exhaustion there's an unknown in that type of things. And it's tire- more tiring. It's a known thing within running. Like it is nice to do a looped course versus these other ones. And I feel like I'm still trying to adjust to that illinearity of my current career choices. Well, I think it takes a lot of courage to even export right now because I think it's so easy as like achievers and people who are like watching our stories from afar yeah. to be like, oh, in the rear view mirror, things make perfect sense. Of course. But when you're in them, there's this sense of wandering Mm -hmm. that is very unsettling, I think probably to everyone, but I think in particular, people who are wired in a way that it is about forward progress, it is about impact, it is about goals, it is about measuring variance, it is about like all of those things. And so the discomfort of like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And does that make me wrong? Yeah. I think wandering is such a good word. Like, I feel like that is such a wonderful, like, description of where I'm at right now. And I don't think it's completely aimless. Like, I'm wandering, searching for things in a very pragmatic and thoughtful way. But it's still wandering. And I've never wandered before. Other thing I experience in this Scared Confident project, because it isn't totally connected to Element 3. You know, it's not really connected to Share Your Genius. It's not really connected to my family. So I don't really have a collaborator in the same way. 
that like when you have an executive team and everybody's working on the same projects and like, you know what I mean? It's like everybody has context for the initiative so you can like export and somebody can say, start there. Like, yeah. Oh, that's so Great. helpful. Thank so you. Obvious. Yeah. The, the self-directedness, really being able to steer myself and have context for where I'm going, but also be present is a, I have found that mental triangle to be really tiring in seasons and Absolutely. you start to get kind of confused. Yeah. So I don't know if you're experiencing that, but I suspect you may where it's like, I go to two day off sites for element three and yeah. we all export and diverge and then we create themes and then we vote and we choose together. You know what I mean? There's <laughs> yeah. a certain sense of security and confidence that comes from saying like, oh, you know, most of the people in the room think we should do this. Then Correct. we should do that. Yeah. Now I have confidence versus when you're kind of roaming about by yourself trying to figure this out. Am I good at this? Because somebody give me some feedback. You know, it's like weird. It's very yeah. weird. It totally is weird. And it again, all the things that I, I, you look like dopamine hits that I got before, like you lose in the same way. Um, and again, I do miss the collaboration. I miss the executive team. I miss having that space and every once in a while when they need something for Goodell Net, I get like this just little like just happy high of like <laughs> yeah. yes, I know that they asked me a question I gave a, an answer shazam like I, I there's there's a sense of peace that I get there versus where I'm at right now which is like kind of figuring out what I'm mm -hmm. doing um but yeah, I missed I missed the community of that I like the self-directed and it's a journey I'm forcing myself to stay in uh -huh. for at least a little bit of who am I saying what success is versus like relying so much on what the award said or what the people said or what my team is saying or what, you know, what our clients need versus like, okay, you've set out what your values are as a person. Are you aligning to those values and forcing myself to be comfortable with me reporting to me, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. totally I feel like in some case, yes, I was at a CEO job, but I reported to 200 people in that organization. Yeah. I reported to 400 clients. Like those are the people that made decisions on whether I was doing a good job. Now I am truly my own little boss cho choosing to say, what's my performance review on my family? What's my performance review on my community impact? What's my performance review on helping others who are going through a really hard journey of their own as a CEO? And I'm the only person that really is giving me that feedback is myself. <laughs> totally, yeah. And I'm like the hardest grader in the uh -huh. world. So like, that is weird. And I kind of miss it sometimes the simplicity of like the business world where totally. you got a, you had a good month, I must be doing something right, <laughs> you know? No, totally. So I think there's not a conclusion. I think that's the point of this conversation. But what I hope people listening understand is that when you find yourself kind of in the trees, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It is part of transition. And we talk about our lives in perfect clarity, I think, when we reflect on them. Mm -hmm. But the journey when we're writing it in real life is very much there's phases where it's very foggy for oh, sure no question so i want to go one more place before we close up here you have a podcast called zero excuses mm -hmm. i would say energy is definitely a like brand essence of nick's morelli but i would also say this extreme endurance zero excuses yeah. is also a big part of who you are so i want to lay i want to like kind of put that on the board and then i also want to kind of beside that put up on the board some of the things that you've talked about of your journey like you didn't use the word burnout but like I hit a wall I crashed correct the zero excuses Nick didn't <laughs> know how to rest well yes and then you and I also had a phone call maybe four or six weeks ago where we talked about this idea of getting to a place where our lives are sustainable how are you beginning to maybe begin the, the process of reconciling this is who you are. Yep. You're an extreme entity. Yes. For better or for worse. <laughs> that crashes through warning signs of rest is important. Correct. And getting to this, you know, working towards this nirvana of life being in a place where it's sustainable. That doesn't mean that it's all easy. Yeah. But that it's like, I can swallow the pill most days. Mm -hmm. How how are you sorting through that? I'm actually trying to reconcile a few of those things. So I'm going to tackle yeah, a you few put, of those what, all what at once. Say, yeah. But I look at zero excuses, Nick, and do I say, especially like, you know, my departure down there, like, did I fail or did I, am I running away from something? And it, and, and the reality is, is no. Um, and it took me a while to get there because I was fearful of this is so much of a part of me. Um, I look at kind of life is this idea of building, again, you said sustainability. And I think that's a perfect word. This idea of consistency over intensity. And I think intensity has its place. And I am so thrilled I lived a life of intensity. 
because it got me to a place where I am today. I feel like I have so many lessons from a coaching perspective of like how to build the right mindset and how to share that and how to get through some of those hard things. I've done it really well and had the right mindset and I saw that mindset fall off and I know what works and what doesn't. Obviously getting my degree, I have the science behind that. Um, but this idea of consistency is the theme for me for the next indefinitely. That's that's one thing, again, going back to like, I have a thesis of what my life is like, is small things every day instead of operating at its red line all the time. And I, I think, you know, for me, I look ahead and I say, I don't have it all figured out. But I'm going to use the example of travel. Um, because of both my jobs and just my personality, I've been to, I don't know, it's like 65 countries, right? Um, and then when I go to those countries, I see all the famous things at each of those countries. I would say, you know, my family and I had this wonderful opportunity to go to France this past year. Um, and we spent a week there and we saw a few of the sites, but we spent six hours in a cafe playing cards with my kids. Like, do I want to still continue to do cool, badass things? Yes. Am I still going to run hundred mile races? Yes. Am I still going to be hopefully the, you know, whatever phase or whatever quote job I'm doing, am I still going to be hopefully elite at those? Yes but I'm going to do it consistently. Um, I don't need to run around Paris to see every single tourist things, but I would still like to go to Paris and I would still like to spend quality time in a consistent manner that says, I'm not going to burn out myself or my family in, in two days and then have five days of recovering mm -hmm. from that. Mm -hmm. And I'll use that as a metaphor for hopefully the way I see for the next bits of my life is I still want to do it all and I still want to be, we'll call it zero excuses, Nick, right? But I'm going to do it with consistency in mind. Mm -hmm. And what that means, again, if you kind of graph, like you look at, like I'm capable of, let's say, 30 energy units on each part of my life. I did, you know, operate at 60 energy units for work, which left me with 20 for the kids and 10 for faith and five for learning new things. Is no, I'm going to have each of those buckets and they're going to operate at 30 each. I would like to live at 30. I don't want to go 10. Gross. That's not, that's not who I am. But I'm going to create maxes for each of those to say, you're redlining in one. What consistent pursuits can that be? And building habits every day that I can truly manage both mentally and physically in order to consistently add up to cool and big, awesome things. Small little Legos stacked up onto each other still builds a big building, but I don't have to build that building in three days. I can build it over a course of years. So spreading out those things in, in a bigger way. Um, is the, again, my theme for the next Yeah, years. I think that's a really powerful word picture. The words that came to mind for me when you started talking, and I think we got to the same place actually, was I think if zero excuses used to be the container your life fit in, mm -hmm. now it's an ingredient. Oh, it's great, yeah. Um, Which is what I think also what you were saying yeah, just yeah. in a different way. It's like it's an ingredient of who I am, but it is not the defining container. No that all things must sort of pass through. Correct. To make their way into your life and existence, which is a real like settled maturity about being able to have that perspective on yourself. And, and again, I'll use this as a, you know, an advocate for, again, I, I see a therapist that helps me mm -hmm. through, I don't have to be Iron Man at every single freaking thing I do. And that does not have to be my personal or public perception is I have to be good at that. And so I'm, I know what I want and I'm still working through some of that. And I think also allowing myself to say, can I be a coach and a consultant speaking to those things? Well, I'm still working through some of those on my own. And I think the answer is, I think it makes me a better one um, because of that as well. Mm -hmm. I've already made like substantial changes to what that looks like. And I've seen it play out. People are used to the caricature, let's call it, of Nick. Uh -huh. You know, and so it's like, oh, Nick will probably do that. Nick will do that. Oh, that's such a Nick thing versus being like, no, it's like moderate Nick now. Yeah. I'm being a little No, 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 it's so true. Point, but, but it's, it's like, so true. No, the rubber band's not going to stretch that far. Yeah. Because I've chosen for it not to. Like, it, there'll be, I think, this, like, weird thing where you almost have to retrain even the social reactions in ways to you. Does that make sense yeah. what I'm saying? But it's bit? also, like, when I walk but it's in. it's just still who, also who you are. A few people had made the comment, and, like, true friends of mine, you know, made the comment, I can't wait for the next big thing you're going to do. And... I kind of give this like kind of half-assed response of, yeah. And in reality, I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that next big thing yet. And maybe, I don't know. Um, but being comfortable with that is really intimidating for me of just, 
or I walk into a room and again, when I walk into a room now, it's, everyone's like the hundred mile race guy, or you're doing yeah. this guy. And now I have to like reframe like what I even talk about. Cause most of the time, like I can talk about those big things and I could use that as a distraction from, I don't know, anything else. And now I could be the, you know, ran an, uh, an appropriately long race guy, uh-huh. uh, you know, <laughs> or a guy that was yeah. with his kids for the last two days and thus didn't do the big thing. Uh-huh. And nobody else saw that. And that's not as fun or cool in sitting at a cocktail hour. And I've got to be okay with, you know, how was the last few days? And I almost feel like now I'm like, I'm doing these big consulting engagements. I'm like, no, actually, you know what? My kids were sick and I just got to spend time with them in a way that I've never been able to do. Maybe this will be my last stop and then we can close. Um, so my husband and I have been become good friends with Nick and Caitlin for lots of reasons. But one of them is also that Caitlin has a big job and you guys have really fought through this two career home thing. So yeah. what has the journey that you've been on been like for Caitlin? But what's the process been like for her in your words? Cause you are not, you guys don't speak for one another. Yeah. But what, in your words, what has the process been like for her? I think it's been, I think it's been interesting. Um, when you're with somebody who is evaluating their time, their values, their priorities, their career, their everything, and they're going through that process, I feel like in some capacity it forced Caitlin to kind of go through a similar exercise when she probably didn't need it in the time that I decided I needed it, right? Um, And so much of our thing was me hustling through my previous job and then leaving and then hustling through this. Like she's only known me as like hustle work Nick. And I think it just, it's reevaluated our relationship in a much bigger way. Anybody I've talked to who has said like, hey, I'm thinking about changing careers or I'm a leader and I'm thinking about maybe following the same cycle is bring your spouse into it because whatever psychological trauma and healing that you're going through, you're taking them along with that crazy ride too and forcing them to reevaluate because we've just gotten used to, to yeah. both of us doing that at the same time. And when, you know, hippie husband now is like, hey, I'm going to be, you know, reading this book and journaling um, and she's like, no, I've got a presentation tomorrow. I'm going to work till 2 a.m. And I'm just sitting there like doing my like, you know, Zen moment. Pursuing my intellectual pursuit. Correct. Yeah. Uh-huh. But we're before, like both of us were up uh-huh. at 2 a.m. till uh-huh. 2 a.m. trying to get something big done. You know, that forces her to be like, what am I doing? Um, in a way that is probably unfair to her. It's been a, not a challenge. It's been an opportunity, but it's shifted our conversations. And you would think you know, it would be, well, I have no more time. I can take the kids. I can do these other things. But, you know, as, especially as a mom, you know, who works, like now I'm the guy that's at the, you know, the kid's lunch or whatever. And she makes the mm-hmm. time for it, of course. And she's amazing at that. I don't know how she does it. But I now have the flexibility for that. Or the kids are off of school. And I'm like, hey, I'll take them for most of the day and we'll go to the science museum. Also, now she has guilt that she didn't feel before because before I was at work and she was mm-hmm. at work uh, and we just had a babysitter and that was mm-hmm. our life. Um, so well, like she's missing out. Or yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, much, it's much more visceral and real and emotional when your husband is the one or the dad is the one who's yeah. spending the time with the kids. I would say, yeah, getting, getting her buy-in on the whole thing and a lot of it has felt like a very like internal introspective journey. And so I would say I I've, I've failed in sometimes just sharing where my head was at because I thought it was my journey. And you forget that your journey, especially as a dad and a spouse, like takes them along with you. Oh, I so appreciate you sharing that so transparently. That was such a different answer than I was expecting. Oh, really? Really cool. I mean, I can see exactly what you're saying. All of those little vignettes that you just walk through, I never would have pictured, but you're right. You would react so differently Yeah. um, on those days. So thanks for sharing that. Okay, this is the actual closeout. We're in the season of Christmas holidays. What are you thankful for right now? Oh, man. Um, I am thankful for the people and experiences of my life that have allowed me to accelerate the maturity that I needed to make what I would say is the hardest life decision I've made over the last 12 months. I'm thankful for, I would say, just like this community. I'll call my family as part of that community is people came into my life I would say what I thought kind of accidentally in the last two or three years that stepped up in a way that was just huge for me. Like just all these people came about when I didn't need them yet. Mm. And yet when I needed it, I had this community that just really shined in a way that like 
made it possible. Um, cause I look at the last year and just think of all I had to do. Um, and I didn't do it alone and I didn't, I don't have this brains or the intellect to have done it by myself. Like I, I needed so many people and everybody just shared, uh, in a real way to me in a time when I knew I didn't need it. Somehow I collected it and asked more out of people than I probably gave back this year. Um, and I'm thankful for people who would, you know, we did that. And that was amazing. Thanks, Nick. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Scared Confident. Until next time, keep telling fear. You will not decide what happens in my life. I will. If you want to get the inside scoop, sign up for my newsletter. We decided to make content for you instead of social media algorithms. The link is waiting for you in show notes, or you can head over to tiffanysouter.com. Thanks for listening.